And welcome into In Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Hey there, I'm Aaron Cheslock. As we do each week, we catch up with local coaches and athletes and walk their path to the particular point of their careers. And uh, what a story we have for you this week. One of the all time great football players to ever come out of the Palmetto State, Robert Porsche, uh, one of the all time greats for the Detroit Lions. Robert, I certainly uh, appreciate the time. I want to start with you. Uh, where I actually first met you at the South Carolina Football Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I talked to you before the whole thing went down, but uh, your former coach, Willie Jeffries, was the master of ceremonies there. Uh, looking back on that, that had to be uh, one of the cooler moments in your, uh, your career and certainly your post-playing career. Oh, absolutely, man. And first of all, thanks so much for ha having me, Aaron. Um, I, Coach Jeffries, man, has always been a, a godsend. I actually transferred from uh, Tennessee State University. That's why I started out of high school. Back to South Carolina State when he left Howard and came back in 1990, it was. So just being there with him, man, he's just a phenomenal man. He was the first celebrity um, that I got a chance to really be around. And it was just how he handled everybody. You know, he was stern with us. He was fair with us. But, you know, instructors, students, anybody who came up to him, no matter what he had going on, man, he always made time for them. And just being there for the three years I was there, um, seeing that firsthand, it really kind of helped shape who I wanted to be when I became a professional. So he, he's, he's a great man. And now to see him, you know, retired and just doing what he does, just being the ambassador of everything. Um, it's just great. So I'm always on it anytime I'm in the same room with him. And definitely if I'm on the same dais with him, it's, it's always a pleasure because he's my guy and I'm his guy. Yeah, I mean, he, he's one of the guys where you literally can't find somebody to say something bad about him, whether you're a no. player or uh, one of his coaching colleagues, uh, you know, regardless of who you talk to, whatever generation. Nothing uh, but the, the top things for Coach Jeffries. You know, we're going to walk through your career in a minute. And you had a long career in the NFL, though, which says a lot about your physical and mental makeup. I want to get your take on a couple things. You know, I, I, I did a little research on you, and you went through some pretty rigorous uh, conditioning programs, and this was outside of normal NFL practices. We see this a lot in today's game, but it wasn't really the norm when you played in the 90s. So uh, I'm curious – what the, uh, what the genesis for that thinking was? And uh, right. can you still remember the types of workouts that you would go through? Uh, yeah, I actually definitely remember it. I had met a trainer down in Charleston, uh, where I'm from, Stacy Dove is his name. And, um, you know, I've always been a person, if I'm hiring somebody to do a certain task or coach, me outside of football with anything I just want them to look like how they're supposed to look and <laughs> he looked like uh the Hulk I mean he was ripped up and but he wasn't he was just great man and he just really pushed me um to levels that I I couldn't go man and his training wasn't overly hard it was just a lot of stretching a lot of light uh weights but it was so many reps and the lunging man and Travis Gervais who played, he was with them too. And a um, couple other guys and all of us who were training under him, we all did really well. So I think that's what it was outside of the training thing. And then towards the end of my career, I, 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 I found out about yoga and I started about my 10th year doing yoga and, you know, just doing hot yoga vinyasa yoga and it and that prolonged my career for at least two three more years easily I wish I had started doing it when I was um when I first came into the NFL well I mean you you could say that but the resume is pretty good man and you know yeah. I, I, I want to touch on that you made a living off uh hitting the opposing team's quarterback a franchise record for Detroit 95 and a half sacks now the game has changed an awful lot in the past three decades since you played my question to you is that how many of those, if you were to guess, how many of those 95 and a half sacks, a percentage, would be categorized today as roughing the passer penalties? And what are your <laughs> thoughts on 
playing defensive line in an age where it seems like the number one priority for the league and officials is protecting the quarterback? That is a great question. So any young players out there that's watching, the key is, the key is to leave your feet. You got to leave your feet when you get close. If you think is, if you think in your mind is going to be kind of on the, on the cuffs marginal, leave your feet so you're diving. So if you're running and you lay out and you're diving and you're off your feet, they're not going to throw the flag because you cannot stop. So how many of those sacks? I, I probably would not, not any, just because of, you know, the old school coaching and just all those little tricks and trades that, you know, some of the young guys, when I watch the game now, I just be like, why did they do that? They just, they just don't know. They just don't know. He's not giving any of them back. I love it. <laughs> they hard to get in the NFL, man. The stack yeah. is hard to get. But like, you know, you made such a big impact on the field. And again, we're going to get to this in a second, but uh, I'd imagine one of the things you're most proud of is, uh, the, the entire Lions franchise naming their Man of the Year award after you. So when you look at all the football accolades that you've accumulated on your resume, I imagine that this one stacks up to anything you did on the field. What, what does that mean to you to have uh, a community service driven an award um, yeah. which made such a big impact? Uh, it was a tremendous honor. It still is a tremendous honor. They still uh, call and, you know, last year with COVID, um, the Lions didn't have the banquet that they usually have. In the past, I've gone to it, and I like to, you know, meet the guys and present them with the award. But, you know, I was intentional about my community service. So uh, I was very honored and very surprised and very humbled when they decided to make that change. But, you know, it was well-deserved because I beat the streets up in Detroit and in Charleston for a while, you know, just trying to give back. I still do things, but, you know, not like I used to when I was younger. Um, only because, you know, my kids are, you know, older and in college and I'm running around with them too. But, you know, as they, as they are now starting to settle into their own uh, life's journey and doing things and don't need me as much, you know, now, you know, the itch is starting to uh, come back a little bit more about, you know, wanting to do more and, you um, I, I'm still elated and happy and excited that, um, you know, the Lions decided to do what they did. It's, it's one of the cooler things I think a football player can uh, have done in their honor. And certainly when you're talking about the National Football League, there's only 32 opportunities to have that kind of honor. Yeah. It certainly speaks to the kind of impact you made. Let, let's get to it. The show is called In Depth, so I want to walk your path a little bit and you know, there's so much meat on the bone here when you're talking about your story. You, you mentioned you were a starter at Tennessee State. Uh, you transferred to South Carolina State. You played under Willie Jeffries from 1990-91. Uh, do you have a favorite memory from your time in Orangeburg? Do you have a Coach Jeffries story that is safe for TV? That you <laughs> now that, you know, he can't make you run sprints anymore. So. <laughs> you know what? No, Coach um... – uh, Coach Jeffries was he was he was pretty low key. You know, we had a good group of guys. Uh, our our uh, captain on the defense my junior year was uh, Reggie Kennedy, who was a big high school coach here in South Carolina. Uh, and Reggie kind of ran, you know, he 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 ran a tight ship. He had us all pretty much in line doing what we we're supposed to do. But I remember um, it was homecoming, and and uh, you know, homecoming is a lot of activities all throughout the week and the team had gotten together and they wanted to go to the step show on Friday. Well, I had just transferred from uh, earlier that season from uh, Tennessee state. And that would have never even been a discussion. We would have been practicing. Our coaches would have made sure we were practicing at 8 PM when the step show started and we got to play on Saturday, like a walkthrough or something. So we couldn't go. So I'm sitting in the back. I was just like, well, what are we doing? This is not going to happen. So it was like Wednesday and, you know, after practice and Reggie was just like, so this consensus is we want to, you guys want me to go talk to coach about us practicing early Friday morning, like at maybe five, so we can go to the step show, right? Everybody's like, yeah. So I was just like, that'll never happen. I was like, this will never happen. Friday came and I'm sorry, Thursday came. 
because after practice, Coach Jeffries called us up and he was just like, hey, I heard you guys want to go to the step show. And I was just like, oh my God, he's about to make us run laps or something. And he was just like, I'm going to do this. Practice is going to be at 5.30 tomorrow morning. Anybody who's late, we're not doing it. And I don't want to hear anything. Curfew is still at the same time, but you guys deserve to be there and have fun and enjoy. I was like, I love this man. I'll run through a brick wall for him. After that day, I was just like, there's nothing I won't do for this guy. He, I, I couldn't believe that, man. I, I, I could not. That was my first instance where coach Jeffries just was just like he's the best he's the best yeah and he, there's some other stories but those aren't this 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 a family show yeah yeah that's not safe <laughs> but you know he, he he is a legend in all cir- in all circles certainly with college coaches but uh HBCU lore without question and I want to get your yeah. take on this you know HBCUs are starting to get some more love nationally which you could argue is overdue uh for a long time you look at some guys they you played against like Deion Sanders at Jackson State and uh, Eddie George at Tennessee State. Uh, yeah. What What are your thoughts on that? And uh, have you considered jumping into that realm at all? Uh, I answer your second question first. No, not for me. Um, it's too time consuming. Um, I, I like to just give what I've been taught. I just I'll just give it away for free. You know, like whenever. I get an opportunity to go down to South Carolina State, which I haven't yet this season. You know, I go down and I'll talk to the guys. I watch film with them. If I'm talking to young players, um, you know, I, I don't. I, I gladly give it to them and show them if they are interested. Just because that's how I learned. I learned from really great players like Jerry Ball and Bruce Smith, and you know, a, lo- a, a lot of the guys that were just like, you know. Pat Swilling, those were all guys who were just like gods when I was young, and they gladly showed me, you know, what they knew. Um, I think with Coach Sanders and Coach George and um, uh, Coach Wheatley up at Morgan State, Tyrone Wheatley, who was from Michigan, he's at the head coach at Morgan State University. I think it's great. And, I mean, I know and a, a lot of people who are uh, – a part of the, uh, you know, HBCU communities and all the athletes, you know, we understand it. I was talking to, uh, you know, Michael Strahan a uh, couple weeks ago, and we were just talking about, you know, he went to Texas Southern in in Houston, and he's getting his his, uh, number retired, I think, next week or the week after. And I was just like, man, that's not bad for a Texas Southern boy. And he just laughed. But, you know, it's one of those things we understand the significance and what it has meant for so many years. But I, I'm glad you have those high profile coaches, especially um, Coach Sanders. You know, I, I wish him nothing but the best of luck because he has taken it almost um, personally, you know, to really showcase and and, 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 and bring to the forefront, you know, just the talent. You know, scouts know it because you know, NFL scouts were there all the time at the schools. But, you know, I think it's great. I, I, I think it's great. And it, and it gives um, other people who may not have had or grew up knowing about uh, South Carolina State or a North Carolina a mm-hmm. it gives them an opportunity now to, you know, like, well, you know, I really wasn't considering the school. And now they will and get a great education and have a great college experience. So I'm all for it. I think it's really cool the fact, you know, and it's twofold really, is that the quality of football has always been good. And it it continues to be good. And you have, you know, Coach Prime down there recruiting some big names where, you know, the the talent is starting to uh, get a little bit more saturated. So, you know, when you got the national platform, uh, these schools are going to be on national TV. Um, you know, it's good for football fans because you get to see good football uh, at different times during the week, but it's also great for the players who get a little bit added exposure uh, in the age of name, image, and likeness that can yes. really uh, impact your uh, wallet as well. So I, I think it's a win-win all the way around. I um, think it's great. And one last point I, I want to add um, to what you were saying. I think it's also important to you know, when I got to the NFL and I started coming into my own, you know, a lot of people would ask, 
why didn't you go to USC or you go to Clemson? Well, I wasn't recruited by those schools because I was a late bloomer. You know, everybody who gets to the NFL isn't a five-star athlete, you know what I'm saying? If they were stars back in the eight, late 80s when I came out, I probably would have been maybe a one or two star. I, I don't know. I would have been lower uh, tier. But I continued to develop. So if I had went to a, a big program like University of South Carolina, I would have probably gotten lost in the shuffle because I wouldn't have been ready right away. But I just continued to develop. And every year I got better and better. And by the time I became a fifth year senior, I was a fifth, it took all five years for me. But by the time I became a fifth year senior, I had it all. Went, got invited to the All-Star Games and I showed up and I showed out, but I needed that time. So that's another thing I always try to you know, stress to young kids, especially football, that everybody doesn't develop right away. Everybody can't be a five-star recruit and everybody can't go to Alabama. You just can't, you know, and you can still have a great experience. You can still, like our scouts told me when they came to Detroit, uh, South Carolina State, they said, Robert, we go everywhere. If you can play, we will find you. It doesn't matter where you go. But, you know, when you're 17, 18 years old, you see the lights and you see playing for national championships. That's appealing to a lot of kids. I get that. But I think you also have to ask yourself if you really a student and study the game of those big name players. Right. How many of them really pan out when they get in the NFL? Not a lot of them. I mean, and sometimes it's just injury. I mean, when you look at Tua down in uh, Miami and what he did, his, 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 his body of work at Alabama, there's nobody, including myself, who didn't think he would be rookie of the year and he would light it up. Now, granted, he's still young. He has some unfortunate injuries, but he's not billing, he's not showing up to where he was drafted as of thus far in his career, but that can change. But I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, I think I, I do, to your point, you know, aware of that. Yeah, I think, you know, not every five-star pans out and not no. every star in, in the college game uh, flows seamlessly into the pros. I mean, you look at a guy like Hunter Renfro, I don't know how many people thought that he'd be able to carry that success over to the pros, and now he's one of the top slot receivers in the game, you know. Your story reminds me a little bit about LeVon Kirkland, who we had on this show a few weeks ago. Um, you know, at a Lamar, he said he'd have never been recruited by Clemson unless they came to see someone else, you know, and he just right. happened to have a great playoff game. I think he was at, uh, you know, Lamar High, which is uh, class 1A. So, I mean, it's not like college scouts are beat. It, it, a lot of it is timing. A lot of it is uh, a lot of it's, circumstance. A lot of, a lot of it's luck. You know, but a lot of it is about Kentucky. You're absolutely right. They and LeVar, LeVar and I, uh, we were in the same draft class in 92. Great guy. Went to Pittsburgh. Well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You're getting right to my next question. I can tell you've been doing this a long time. You were picked in the first round, 26 to 92. And I did research that draft class a bit. There's a lot of Palmetto State guys in it. Uh, a lot, man. Chester McLaughlin out of Clemson. Uh, LeVon That's Kirkland, cool. who you just mentioned. Robert Brooks, Gerald Dixon from USC. But you know what? Here's the other thing I noted is that, you know, yes, you were in the same draft with guys like Desmond Howard, Troy Vincent, um, but there are a lot of guys picked ahead of you in the first round that I've never heard of. And I've been watching football for a couple decades now. So my question to you is going to a South Carolina state, do you think that you went to an HBCU and not a traditional power five uh, college, and yet to your point that you mentioned you were a late bloomer, does that affect your draft stock at all in hindsight? Do you think that you should have been picked higher? Do you think you would have been picked higher if you went to a Clemson in Alabama, something like that? And uh, just anything else you want to add on your draft process as well? Go feel free. Yes. Oh, no, no question about it. I mean, no question about it. I, um, I remember you, you had a lot of people. Uh, Steve Edman was number one pick out of Washington and he, 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 I mean, in college, he looked like a man amongst boys, but he never really materialized in the NFL, which happens, it happens often. 
I mean, a lot of teams said they were going to pick me, but again, you have to understand how the draft works and they slot players and a lot of teams stick to their draft boards. And, you know, sometimes they may, they may need a certain position, but they have somebody else slotted higher. So they're going to stick to the board and they're going to take that person, even though they really don't need that person. So it's a lot of variables that go into it. Um, I remember uh, on draft day, you know, a lot of teams are called and I was just like, yeah, I've always wanted to play for whatever team called me and then they pick somebody else. So then they call again. And I was just like, yes, I've always wanted to pick, you know, play for it. And they pick somebody else. So I got about three calls. I knew Buffalo, who the Bills, who had the next pick after the Lions that year was the last pick in the first round. I knew they would draft because I had met the owner, the uh, late Ralph Wilson, and him and John Butler, who's also passed, who was a general manager. They were as he was at South Carolina State all the time, and he was making it known I was his guy. And the owner told me, "Our guys say you're our guy. You can come up to Buffalo." We're going to put you at left end. We got Bruce Smith on, on the right. And we're just going to ride out with both of y'all for the next eight, nine years. And I almost passed out because Bruce Smith, of course, was my idol. So, you know, Chicago Bears had the, I think, like the 22nd pick or something. And then they called and said, would you have a problem playing for Coach Mike Dicker? I was like, I've always wanted to play for the Bears. And Coach Dick, I'd love to play for them. <laughs> He's like, we're going to either pick you or Alonzo Spellman. And if we don't pick you, good luck. And they picked Alonzo. Of course, he went to Ohio State. I, I, I get all that. But I always, whenever we played the Bears, which was twice a year in our division, I always made sure they understood they made the wrong choice. And, you know, it just, it just, it just drove me to want to compete and show that nah, I can play. I can definitely play. But you... I don't think that's so much a factor. It probably still is some degree, but I don't think it's as big of a factor as maybe it might have been back in the late 90s, you know, because a couple of years later, I mean, you know, you, you, we've just had a lot of guys that have come and had really strong careers out of uh, small schools, out of HBCUs. So, I mean, look at Darius Leonard. He, he is just phenomenal what he's doing up there at Indy. But another thing happens also that helps is when teams go to schools like a South Carolina State, right? And they pick like a Harry Carson in the sevens. He turns out to be a perennial all pro Hall of Famer. Um, he's defensive, was a defensive end. You got like a Donnie Shell, those guys. Then you keep coming back and those guys work out. And then, you know, in the 90s, you take somebody like me and I really pan out as a first round pick, well, then when Darius is doing what he's doing in college as a linebacker and he has all the measurables and he's fast and he's tall, he got real long arms, you know, he can get off blocks, he can bend, all the terms that you have to check off when you're scouting a player. Well, you, you, you don't mind going out on a limb because you've seen other players there, you understand that system of what they're doing and you get comfortable with it. So I think it's changing. And hopefully at some point that won't be the case, but it is what it is, man. You still got to play. And I do think that, you know, we, we mentioned the, the amount of broadcasts that are uh, focusing on HBCUs now, but I also think, you know, uh, the evolution of the internet and social media and all that, uh, this is one of the, you know, uh, I'm not, I got very uh, choice words when it comes to that kind of stuff, but I do think this is one of the positives of it. Uh, certainly right. for college athletics and high school recruits is, it gives a, a platform that goes nationwide, internationally, in fact, um, where it can at least spark something in the brain of a scout where they say, maybe I should go look in this little nook of South Carolina to see right. uh, if there's something here. And as you mentioned, uh, those guys get paid a lot of money to evaluate talent. If you can play, they will find you. But did the Lions make the right pick? My goodness, going to embarrass you a little bit here. 12 years in the pros, 435 solo tackles, 95 and a half sacks. That's a franchise record. 18 forced fumbles as well. He led the Lions in sacks eight times during that 12-year career, uh, a franchise record for the season that still stands today, 15 sacks in 1999, an all-pro and pro bowler in 98, 2000, 2001. Um, now, the, the one thing I do want to ask you about, though, yeah, one interception. 
and they had one interception. Yeah, it, it was a five yard return. So yards. as a guy, uh, you know, in high school I played middle linebacker, and I'm a big Ophi guy. It's not that fast, right? Um, so I just plugged the eight gap and hope that the guy ran right into me. But you're obviously a different stratosphere. So my question to you is: I imagine uh, you get in that interception, and you're a big old boy. Do you see daylight and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm about to hit pay dirt, man? Or was yeah, I was it, on the I, I was on the five yard line. I just had to go, go on the five, five yard line. Yeah. Did you return we for were, a touchdown? We were, we were playing the Vikings. Okay, I just give me the story because I got my yeah, Dante Culpepper, and it was loud. It was loud. We were playing at Ford Field in New Stadium, and it was loud in there, man. And they were backed up. They were like on their five, and they dropped. He was throwing like a screen pass, and you know, of course, the lineman came through and one of the guys tipped it. So when he tipped it, 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 it pushed the ball up. And I was right there and I just grabbed it. I just had to run five yards. I was, I mean, I was right there. So it was easy. You did take it back for a touchdown. Oh, I did take it back. Yeah. Well, I just, I ran five yards. It was, but, but, but when I'm with the guys and I'm telling the story or if I'm talking to my son and I'm telling the story, it's, it's, it's like a Steven Spielberg production. It's like massive. Like I ran like 500 yards and it was snowing. Uphill and... both ways. <laughs> the story changes the more I tell it. <laughs> uh, I, I love it, man. Look, I, I, I wish I looked the category over on your stat sheet. I probably would have seen touchdown next to it. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I touchdown. didn't give you the benefit of the doubt. That's on me. Yeah, no, I, I think I've had two interceptions. I've had two interceptions, I think. I got another one off the screen, too, from Green, uh, Brett Favre at the Silverdome. That's pretty good. They ran a screen, Dorsey, Levin, the running oh, back. Minnesota came Brett Favre. No, the Green Bay Packers. At, oh, at the Silverdome. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. At the Silverdome, yeah. yeah, yeah. And a, somebody came to cut me, and I put my hands down, and he threw the ball, and I caught it, but... I think it was a one yard, <laughs> one yard. I got one yard and somebody got me. So we're underestimating the hands, what, what you're saying. Oh, yeah, I got good hands, man. There you go. You got to look the ball in. Always look it in. <laughs> uh, I, I look it go in and then right by me, and then I just keep on looking. Yeah, you got to uh, look it in, man. You, uh, I'm sure you get Barry Sanders questions all the time. Oh, I do. Most – People in your generation, if I were to ask, most defenders, I should say, who was the toughest guy to tackle? 99% of them would say Barry Sanders. Oh, of course. Practiced against him. My question is, who was the toughest guy for you to tackle? And how do they compare with Barry Sanders? So I, I want to know the great ball carriers, and, and that could be a wide receiver after the catch, something like that, uh, that you played against. Um, but I also think, you know, that the allure of Barry Sanders isn't as prevalent as it should be in today's game because uh, what he did on the football field, uh, the only word I could use to describe it is magical. So who were the guys that you had trouble during the game and how would you compare them to number 20? I think Robert Smith, who was a running back for the Vikings, he came out of Ohio State. He was always tough because he was a track guy. So he had really long strides. Um, he didn't look like he was moving, man, but he he was covering a lot of ground, so he was he was tough if he got if he was able to turn up, you know if he was going lateral he wasn't he was just pretty much average. But once he could turn it up, uh, it, it was trouble. Marshall Falk was always just, you know, you had to be aware of where he was at all times when he was on the field because he was like Barry, he was really quick make a lot of cuts. Uh, Emmett Smith, I didn't play, we didn't play, surprisingly, we didn't play the Cowboys a whole lot, but he was just a threat because he was always running downhill, man. Like his line was so massive. Before you could get off those guys, he was already by you. That was always, um, you know, a problem. Um, Barry, on the other hand, of course, you know, in the NFL, there isn't a lot of tackling in practice. And, Wayne Fonts was the head coach for most of Barry's years that we played together, which was my first eight years there. And um, he would just always bring us up like the first day of practice, contact practice. He would 
after we did individuals, he would bring everybody up and say, where's Barry? And bring him in the middle and, and say, guys, this guy right here, do not touch him when he's in there. Like he almost cut a guy one day in practice. Like literally, he, Harry Colon is his name. And Barry was in there. And, you know, when Barry would be in there, you know, we were in line, we would just stop, you know, pretty much. And he'd run by. Well, Harry's a safety and he came up and he was just really thudding him, just, you know, just hitting him with his little shoulder. But when he hit Barry, Barry's about to make a cut and he depleted him. He fell. Barry fell. So Wayne was on his cart. He started blowing a whistle. He ran over there. He picked Barry up. He dusted him off. He's like, God damn it, Harry. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. He brought up. He's like, didn't I tell you not? Harry, Harry's like, Coach, I'm so, so sorry. I didn't mean to catch you. He's like, Barry, you okay? Barry said, Coach, it's okay. It's all right. He said, Harry, you touch him again. <laughs> it was funny, man. We still clown Harry to this day about that. That was over 25 years ago. And we still clown him about that today. Barry, the best football player you ever saw? Yes, because he had the ability to go 80, 90 yards on any given play. And the thing I, I always admired about him, he really caused me to have to change my work ethics because I thought I was working until I saw him work. And uh, I was just like, wow, this is not what I expected. You know, I thought I was doing something. And, uh, you know, he just ran his gasters every day after practice. And it didn't matter if he had a game and he had 200 yards or he had a game where he had 40 yards. And there were some games he had 40 yards rushing the whole game. He'd still come in. On, I can still tell you his schedule. He'll come in on Mondays after the game. He's going to go in the weight room. He's going to get dumbbells. He's going to do a couple sets of bench dumbbells. He's going to put 225 on the squat rack. He's going to do like three sets of squats. He's going to do a couple curls, a couple other little things, and that's going to be it. And he would stick to that program. And then on Wednesdays and Thursdays, he's going to run his gassers across, across the field after practice. He's going to run two sets of gassers, like from gassers from one sideline to the opposing sideline, turn, come back, go back. He'd do two sets of those. It didn't matter if he did 200 yards in a game, 20 yards in a game. He did that routine every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And he said he stretches 10 minutes every night before he go to bed. So I was like, if he's doing that, then I don't have no excuse. And I, I do think it's important, you know, for, if you're a younger football fan watching or listening to this and you're, you know, on Sundays, you're encapsulated by Lamar Jackson or – by Michael Vick when he was playing, or you know, you you can swear that nobody's better than Ladanian Tomlinson or Adrian Peterson or any of these guys. I would strongly encourage that you go on YouTube and watch some Barry Sanders highlights. Um, I agree, man. It was, he was, yeah. and I was there for a lot of them. I mean, I, 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 a lot of those highlights, I was there on the side. I can tell you, you know, I, I can. There's a lot of them I can. I could be a commentator and tell you. This is what's happening on the field because I used to always tell people I played, they would always ask, how is it with him playing with Barry? It's like you to, to really appreciate him, you have to be on the sideline and see it in real time because it is just, like you said, it's, it's, it was magical, man, to see him take a handoff and is going to the uh, visitor's sideline off tackle play, right? To see him start that direction, everybody's blocking to their left because the play is supposed to go left. He gets to the line, finds a crease, and then he comes, he cuts back and he's coming back to the right. Like he's running to the sideline and you sitting there like, where the hell is he going? And then he just turns up and spins and 50 year, yards later, he's in the end zone. He's just like, did you see that? Yep. This is crazy. It, it's, it's breaking guys' ankles, changing the direction of dime. And I mean, there, there are a lot of those uh, 60, 70, 80 yard touchdown runs where he ran a lot more than that 60, 70, 80 yards where he's cutting across the field, as you mentioned. 
Um, I am, man. I know. It's you know, it, it was it was incredible, man. Incredible. I, I was lucky, but, but he's not he's money. not doing that anymore. No, <laughs> he's not doing that anymore. <laughs> You're probably still not allowed to hit him, though. Trust me, Barry's looking like a uh, a, a nose tackle now. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> he's put up, he's. He's put on some pounds. Mm -hmm. He's he's not doing them curls on Monday. He's curling honey buns, man. <laughs> uh, he's earned it, man. I mean, that's yeah. one of the best athletes of all oh, time. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> we'll get back to your uh, career. You, you, you wrap up in the early 2000s, post-playing days. You've uh, you kept yourself pretty busy, man. You know, uh, I want to start with, uh, you tried out front office work, both in Detroit, obviously, and in Pittsburgh. Uh, why didn't that work out? It just it, it, Was it a, a situation where the roles didn't fit, or were you just looking to take a break from football at that point after it uh, you know, taken up so much of your life? Well, when I, when I first retired, I had an opportunity to um, go right upstairs with the Lions, and I just needed some time, man, just to unplug just for a year. So I took about a year and a half off, two years. And um, then I came back and did a scouting internship with the Lions, which was good. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. It, it. it gave me an opportunity to really see the other side of it. And, you know, by the time I kind of really wanted to get into it, we were having some changes there in management and it just didn't work out. Then I went up to Pittsburgh and did an internship, and I really enjoyed that organization. For me, it was the first time in my, by then, like 14, 15 years of being around football that I'd actually like been at a practice at another organization facility. I had never not known anything but Detroit, and that was, that was really good. But one of the other guys who was a scouting internship Doing the scouting intern, he played for Pittsburgh. He played for the Steelers. So when an opportunity came up for a scouting, of course, you know, they hired their guy. And um, after that, I was just like, you know what? I have, you know, made a lot of connections and done a lot of stuff. And I'm just going to go into business for myself. So, you know, I started a transportation company, a trucking company. And actually, my office is up in Greer. South Carolina and been in business now what nine ten years so you know that's worked out pretty good for me and you know we do a good job and um we got trucks in Greer and Union South Carolina and then we got a lot down in Charleston too so you know it's been good it's it's given me an opportunity to uh grow a business you know because we started with one driver and one truck and you know, now we got 30 drivers and um, 25 trucks. So, you know, things are going pretty good. And, and when you're working for someone else, you are at their mercy, you know. But I like that we are growing at a pace that I can dictate, you know. So, and I'm building something that, you know, one day, you know, I don't know. One of my kids may want to work in there too one day. So that's always been a thing to be able to, you know, leave a legacy. What was your biggest, uh, you know, you guys certainly at your level um, are such creatures of habit. And you just went through, you know, the rigorous stuff you used to do just to get ready for games on Sunday. And that's a very strict schedule. It's a very, um, you know, uh, conducive lifestyle in order to make sure that your body's in tip top shape, you're mentally prepared and all that. What was the biggest adjustment to going into the business world, not playing football? Was it easier? Did you have things that you had uh, trouble doing? I mean, I, I'd imagine it's a complete culture shock, really. Uh, you know what? I, I have always worked during the off season. I was always a guy who, you know, a couple of my teammates always kid me, you know, you're going to fake business, man. Yeah. <laughs> But I was always interested, I, you know, I learned at an early age in professional football how to leverage my celebrity and what I did to work in my favor. Meaning, you know, like when I would be out, 
people were always interested and wanted to ask questions about, you know, like Barry Sanders and, and then of course myself and the team and all that. And of course, some things like I couldn't answer, but I would always leverage it and, you know, trade questions about what they did and how did they get started. And so it was always in my mind that I would eventually get to that point. And it, it just really served me well. And, you know, over the years, I've, I've established some really great friendships just because of my willingness to be, you know, myself and have a good time and, and, and learn. And I don't mind, you know, putting in the work. I don't mind doing it. So for, before I started, you know, I, I did an internship at a Budweiser distributor when I was playing that Lions had franchised me one year. And back then, if you got the franchise tag and the NFL actually changed how they franchised because of what happened with me. The only thing I really regret, because back then Paul Taglebu was the commissioner and Roger Goodell was, I can't remember what his title was, but I actually, you know, he wasn't the commissioner, but I got to know him a little bit too because of the process. The only thing I wish I had done, I wish I had told them that I wanted them to, to call it, you know, the Robert Porsche rule. Because what happened back then, if a team franchised you, right? <clears throat> so you had to uh, decide who was your franchise player by 4 p.m. So the Lions back then was notorious for you know, just stalling and waiting on contracts negotiation until the last hour. So I had already gone through a couple of contracts with them and I knew that's how they operated. So me and my uh, uh, lawyer, we were ready for it. So at like 310, you know, now it heats up and it was a lot of back and forth. And um, they were just like, well, they were gonna franchise me. So at like five minutes to four, I called back and told them I would accept the deal because it was the language and some of the language and the signing bonus wasn't right. So they had already went down the hall. So somebody ran down the hall to stop them, you know, to say they wanted to fax it in. Well, when they were going to fax it in and say that, okay, we agreed to a deal, it was like 402. So I got franchised, which meant back then that happened in February. That means you couldn't have any contact. You can you can come to the facility. You can do anything until like after the league year starts again, like in June. Or it was some crazy stipulation. So they ch after that, they changed it where if if you are a franchise, if you're gonna franchise a player and you know you don't meet the deadline, but you're close or you're working in it then it gets extended so you can get it done because of what happened to me where we'd agree, but it just, the facts didn't go through in enough time and you couldn't do it. Okay. So we got some fun ones to wrap up here. Uh, I do have one question that I've been loathing asking you, not quite sure the right way to ask it. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. You had a successful NFL career. However, you were on five line teams that made the playoffs and they went 0-5 in the postseason. Oh Can you encapsulate how frustrating that is looking back on your career? Everyone knows of, you know, Detroit struggles of the franchise and the postseason, but being in it so close, and for, I got to relive some of this, so I apologize in advance. So close a couple of these times. Four-point loss to the Packers in 93. Four points again to the Packers in 94. Philly in 95, Tampa in 97, Washington in 99. What's the reason? And which one of those stands out the most? Um, I think the Green Bay ones stood out a lot only because, you know, I think in 93 or 94, I can't remember which year it was, we should have won the game. We were playing at home. We had just played them like the week or two before and we beat them. We should have won the game. Um, the NFL is really, when it's happening, it's so high pressure because everything you're doing is just repetition, right? You're just, re in practice, you're just going over certain situations. 
everything is you you you're preparing for certain situations and as a game Sterling Sharp caught the winning touchdown what happened on the play we didn't get the call so as opposed to the coordinator just calling the timeout because Green Bay was in a no huddle and they were moving down the field because I think they were out of timeouts they were moving down the field they got a, a completion and they were like I think maybe like on the 40 like hour 40 or yeah, like hour 40. I'm out there and this crowd is 80,000. We can't hear anything. Nobody knows what the call is and the coordinator and the coaches don't call a timeout. I should have taken, I was young, but I was, if you look at that clip, you can see me saying, what's the call? What is the call? So nobody knows what the call. Sterling runs, I, 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 I can't even remember the route he ran, but he gets behind the DB because nobody knows the call. Brett Favre runs back. I die for him, but I miss. I didn't hit him before he threw the ball. And Sterling catches it in the end zone. He's just standing in the end zone, just smiling like, oh, my God, I can't believe this just happened. And we're sitting there just like, I can't believe this happened. Either. That one really bothered me because we should have won that game. That one always stands out. The, the, the red skin one stands out. I saw a Stephen Davis running back. Who was played with the Panthers a couple of weeks ago? His son, uh, uh, guy. Yeah, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, man. And um, our sons play at uh, North Carolina and team. We were at one of the games, and he was laughing. He's like, "Man, you remember you were fighting the quarterback during the playoff game?" And he was just like, <laughs> just like "Man, what were you thinking about?" I was like, "I don't know, man. I don't know. I was frustrated." <laughs> So that one stands out too because I thought we should have won in Washington. Tampa, um, you know, Tampa Bay was just, they were on the cusp of becoming that dominant team that they are. And um, down there, you know, Warren Sapp was young and he was just, I mean, he was just nasty. And it was just one of them games where we just, they were, we were just overmatched. Period. You're overmatched. You yeah. uh, you played with some all-time greats in your generation, both offensively, defensively. I know you spent a lot of time with some of these guys in the Pro Bowl and all that good stuff. Uh, so, two-part question: Taking yourself out of it, who's the best defender you've ever seen, and who's the best defensive lineman that you've ever seen? Ooh, that's a good question. I'd have to say, I, I'll start with a defensive line. I'd have to say, I would have to say Bruce Smith just because of his size and what he was, what he was doing to guys, man. It was just incredible to see a guy that was like 265 pounds. I mean, just tossing guys that were six, seven, 340 pounds. <laughs> it was unreal. I, I remember every time we would play them, as soon as I, you know, when we would come off the field defense and we would go over everything with the coaches, I was up on a knee, you know, just so I could see him and just what he was doing and like how our linemen, like they just all had to look like, you know, they just, they all were. I remember we played up in Buffalo and our left tackle, Bruce, the game started. He just got in his stance and he just flinched and he, he jumped. It was all sides. <laughs> just like, he was just like. <laughs> and then a couple, a couple uh, like the next quarter, he got hurt and our backup came in. As soon as he got in, he flinched again and he jumped. Like as soon as he got, I mean, it was just, they were just. Yeah, he, it was unreal how, how he did it. Reggie White was, of course, Reggie White, but you would expect what he did from him because he was so big. You know, Reggie was like 6'6", 315. So he is a big man. So for him to toss, you okay, you expect it, but, you know, Bruce is like 265. I mean, he's not big. Play um, Defender, I would say 
probably for me, man, Randall McDaniel, who's a guard for the Vikings, all pro, pro bowler, um, Hall of Famer. He just had a real unorthodox stance. And he was just so strong. It was unreal how strong he was. He, he didn't look strong, but and he just could move. He was fast and he was strong. And I hated when I had to go inside and play against him. But everybody hated it. I was Michael Dean Perry and I was together a couple of weeks ago. We were just, you know, we were just talking. I was like, I was like, Mike, who gave you problems? And he was like, man, Randall McDaniel. <laughs> I was just like, what? He's like, yes. It's like you, he gave you problems. He's like, yeah, man. So yeah, Randall McDaniel. I love it. Best offensive lineman, best defensive lineman. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you're, you're a South Carolina boy, uh, Palmetto State product, and college football is king down here. How much do you keep up with college football these days? I know you're watching your kid. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you have such an illustrious career in the NFL, do you find yourself focused more on pro football with the Lions or South Carolina football uh, just from growing up here in the South? Uh, you know what? Um, I watch some college football. I, I mean, you know, I, I love football, but it's on so much now. You know, it's it starts with the NFL on Thursday and it goes till Monday. And, you know, when you get into De December, man, it's just like, oh, God, it's just too much. And for me, I'm always watching as if I'm studying film. So it's hard to just be like, yes, I'm cheering. And, you know, I'm just, I was like, what he's doing? Why did he do that? You know, it's just, it's always, it is always that. So I watch it, but some Saturdays, you know, I, I don't watch it all the time just because it's just on so much. And then, you know, with, with ESPN plus and all this, you, you can watch, I mean, you can watch it every day. You, I'm curious about that, though, just not to cut you off, but, you know, obviously you watch your son a lot, who's a defensive lineman as well, but um, can you take the analytical hat off then and just root for your kid? Of course I'm rooting, but I'm, I'm always critiquing, especially him, you know, but it's not a critique from a standpoint of. You just can't turn it off. You, you can't, yeah, once you've been in it, you, you, you cannot watch it and not, you know, watch it like you're studying it. But yeah, I definitely root. I'm always rooting, you know, rooting for him and rooting for whatever team he's on. Like I told him, except for when they play South Carolina State in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but, you know, it's hard not to, you know, like, hey, on this play, you did that. And, you know, I'm just, but he, he, he likes my input, so. I guess that's a good thing. You're one of many to come out of this state and have uh, pro careers. I'm curious, uh, do you think that South Carolina from a national picture, since you've been so many places at this point, gets overlooked as sort of a hotbed for uh, football talent? We always hear about Florida and Georgia and Louisiana, Texas. Um, North is kind of like Ohio, Pennsylvania. And, uh, South Carolina doesn't really get thrown into that a lot, but if you look at rosters of NFL teams, there's a lot of not just Clemson and South Carolina guys, but uh, the smaller schools like South Carolina, out of, and guys that grew up in South Carolina. So, uh, you know, I've noticed it since I've been down here uh, about a decade now. Uh, yeah. Do you think that the state gets overlooked? Uh, it probably does, but, you know, I think when you compare it to – the number of NFL players that are from the state of Florida, you know, Georgia and Texas. Yeah, we have a lot, but there's no, <laughs> there's no comparison to those, just those three states. But yeah, I, I, I do like how the numbers are increasing from the state, but, you know, um, I, I think the difference is, you know, my kids, we lived in Florida, in Orlando, and, so many, so many high schools there, and they're so massive. I mean, you know, my my son went to high school. His graduate, his senior, his his high school. There was forty five hundred kids at his high school. My daughter went to another high school that was like three miles down the road. 
her senior year, it was 3,800. Like in a three, that's just two high schools, like three miles apart. It's, I mean, you just have them and they're so mass, so many. So I think that is probably the reason why, you know, that um, when you look at those states and Texas is just, you know, some of my teammates, you know, when they talk about their high schools and how things are down there, you, you just, I mean, you, you can't, you, it's hard to believe that they are that big and doing the things that they do. So, but I, I do like how, I like how South Carolina is trending. It's trending upward, which is a good thing. Yeah, without question. And I'll back you up on that uh, Texas high school thing. I remember I covered uh, Clemson at uh, Texas a and a few years back. Um, and just driving through those small Texas towns on my way to College Station, you, you think you're looking at college campuses and then All you right. find out that that's a high school. It's just, it's mind blowing. Um, yeah. I can't imagine the amount of money that they're pouring in the, the athletic department there, but yeah, there, yeah. there is a difference there without question. It's good uh, all right. I, this has been a treat for me as a football fan. I got one more question for you. Um, and you know, it's take your, take your time answering it because you do have such an incredible story. Um, but for those that are watching this, whether they, uh, grew up watching you uh, or, you know, they're being introduced to the Robert Porsche story for the first time. Uh, you know, a guy from a small town who went to a small school that went on to do very big things at the highest level of professional football. What do you hope those people, uh, what, what everybody takes from your story um, that you, re you reach the pinnacle of your craft? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I, it's, it's really, it's something I never really think about until, you know, it's, it's said out loud. I, I just think that I, you know, came up in a time where I had very supportive parents. You know, um, I think that's important also. Um, and I had a chance to develop at, at every level. So I, 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 um, I just, you know, like a lot of guys during my journey, for example, when I went to Tennessee State that year in our class, it was five of us that were defensive ends that came in. Five of us. All of us were pretty much the same build size. First guy who got a chance to play, his name was Andre. I'm not going to say his last name. He looked, I mean, he just, he looked like a god, a Greek god. He was just chiseled. I mean, he was just big, strong, cut up. I mean, just, ah, uh, he could run, but he couldn't make any plays, right? So he got a chance to play first. That didn't work out. The next guy came from Texas. He was a big guy. He could play, but he couldn't remember the plays, <laughs> you know, so... He get in practice or in the game, he's supposed to slant right, and he everybody's going right, and he's going left. So after a game or two, he can play because he couldn't remember the plays. Third guy was a guy from Georgia. Um, he was a good guy, but he just they ended up moving him to um, offensive line, and he did okay. Well, then I was the last one who got a chance. You know, now I was frustrated the whole time watching these guys. I was just like, well, wait a minute, man. But when I got in, I just said, they never get a chance again. And they didn't. None of them did. I, by the third game I started, my first year, I didn't play the first year. It was red-shirted. So I, this was our sophomore year. And when I got in, I was just like, they're not going to get a chance again. So, and they didn't. So my, my thing has always been, and I kind of had a similar story kind of like that too, believe it or not, when I got to the NFL and I was a first round draft pick. But I just, at every position, at every stop, I just really kind of honed in and I didn't get down too down on myself. And if things weren't going the way I was hoping they would, and it didn't go exactly like I wanted to when I got to South Carolina State either, but it was because of an injury. But I would just start over, you know, like, okay, we got we to dial it back. We got to dial it back and look at how and what do I need to do? So I kept looking at the big picture. What do I need to do um, to, to make things better? And every time I did that, 
kind of like started over, then it just helped me get a little bit further. And then I just kept progressing. And I can't stop saying enough, but I just progressed at every level. And that's what happens with a lot of guys. We all have in football, because I haven't played other sports, you have a, a life to your football journey, a football, that's how I look at it, football life, right? It's going to expire at some point. And some guys have a long life and they go for years like Tom Brady. It's incredible how he's still playing and he's played, what, 20 something years now? It's nuts. But his football life is still going. Now he's doing the things he has to do to prolong it. But it's still incredible, man, the level he's playing at. And a lot of guys fizzle out from high school to college. They just fizzle out. It's just, it's over. Whereas mine, I, I wasn't aware of it at the time. It was wide open. And I could just keep making the jump. The game was never too fast. So at the first, so the first game I played in college, I didn't know what I was looking at. I got my head beat in. But the second game, I still got my head beat in, but I didn't get it beat in all 25 snaps. And it just kept decreasing, decreasing. And I just can't, I, I just kept getting it. So I, the only thing I try and tell people is that, hey man, you just gotta be aware that the speed of the game changes. And the way you process it has to become faster because all you're doing is reacting. That's all that it is. You're reacting to what you see and anticipating things. And I just began to really get good at that. I wasn't fast, but I was quick because I, I just started looking at like all the other guys on the team could run 40 yards faster than I could, but none of them could run 10 yards faster. And 10 yards, 10 to 12 yards is the furthest that the quarterback is going to be from me in the pocket. So I just was just like, well, I just got to get 10 yards faster than this guy who is backing up, who doesn't know where he is. The quarterback is back there. He's just, he knows where he's supposed to be. So then it's little things like little mind games. You get off and I'm looking inside, like the quarterback is inside because he's, he's looking at me and he's reacting to what I do. So if I'm giving a fake and looking like I'm going inside, he's going to stop. Now I just go on a five. So it was just those little things that I just continued to try to fine tune and develop that would make me kind of have a little bit of an edge. Well, and it just, I think, you know, I, I would add to that. I, well, no, I appreciate the, uh, the honesty there. I think that's some real advice that you gave, but I, I do think, uh, you get a little bit of a chip on your shoulder at every stop. Uh, helps the work ethic and helps you outwork the rest. But I, you know, that that's one of the cooler stories I've heard. To be honest with you, the fact that you're the fifth guy in, and you go with the mindset of they're not getting another chance. And look yeah, I, I think I had maybe I did have a little chip in college, but when I got to the NFL, the only thing I wanted to prove was I wanted I always wanted to prove to the Fords our owners, that, and of course he didn't care. He didn't know, you know, he didn't care about who they picked. But to me, you know, it was always important that they recognize that they didn't make a mistake in coming and taking me from a small school. They just, I, I, that was very important to me that they always knew they didn't make a mistake and that I wasn't going to do anything that was going to embarrass my parents, my siblings, my family. And I wasn't going to do anything that was going to embarrass the organization. Those things were just really big to me. And when I retired, um, you know, I'd, I had a, back then I used to have a restaurant in Detroit, a couple of restaurants. And I called Mr. Ford's office. And uh, his secretary asked, this is William Clay. He, he passed a couple of years back, about four or five years ago now. And um, she was like, well, Robert, uh, what is going on? I was like, well, I wanted to invite Mr. Ford and Mrs. Ford to come down to my restaurant and have uh, dinner. Because I was like, I want him to see, you know, what I'm doing. Because I, I was like, I don't know if he knows, you know. And I was, you know, that my restaurant has been restaurant of the year two years ago and everybody comes here and I, I, I want him to come and see it and, 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 and have dinner. 
And she's like, oh, that's so nice. She's like, well, you know, he doesn't get out a whole lot now. He's been getting older. And um, but she's like, you know what? I'll pass the message on to him, but he's probably not going to do it. I said, well, that's great. I just want to extend the invitation. She's like, all right, thank you so much. I'll give him a call. I'll give him. She's like, but remember, he's probably not going to. I said, like, all right, that's fine. So then the next day she called back. He wants to know when can he come. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's awesome. So we planned a dinner man and him and Mrs. Ford, his wife, um, who's, who's who well, just retired a couple of years ago. Uh, she's like, I think she's like 93, 94 now. They came and one of their daughters came and man, we sat and we had dinner and he was just like, Rob, man, I'm so proud of you, man. He's just like, he said, man, you've just been great, man, just for the team and what you, so, you know, just hearing that, you know, from him, it, it, it really meant a lot. and. It just made me feel complete that I didn't know how my career was going to pan out when I first got to Detroit some 15 years before that. But all those things that I thought to myself, how I said I didn't want to embarrass them, I wanted them to know that they had made the right investment. He said all those things. And it was just like, wow, it's just like, it was just like, man, you just said, I can't be more pleased than what you've done, that you played here. He said, I just hate. Never got it together for you and some of the other guys, but we're gonna just keep working on his zip up. So man, I appreciate you, man. And that just meant a lot that he actually said it because he didn't have to. He could have just been like, nah, I don't have time. So that 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 was a good cherry on top for me. And I just hated that. You know, I was a part of those teams, those five teams that just came up short, like in a big way. That I think that's the only thing that still digs at me about my anything everything else is just no nah, i wouldn't change anything but that not getting a close to a super bowl is that's that's a tough one but hey you look, have to. you look at the the accomplishments though i mean just to touch on that story that's a pretty cool moment of closure there that not a yeah. lot of folks get so uh you know it's really cool that you embrace uh how important that was i thought of one more question to end on a light note before i let you go who's your 95 and a half sacks the most ever in detroit lions history who's your favorite guy to sack the one that you know maybe when, when you hit him you got that uh, sound uh you know who, who, who's the one that sticks out you know what uh nobody really sticks out um of course brett Favre because he was in you know all those years he was in um well, most of them, yeah, just by all of them. He was in, um, no, I think my last two years, he might have been in Minnesota. But, you know, he was in Green Bay, and he was he was the man. He was the face of the NFL, and he was tough. I mean, he was a competitor. And, um, of course, I've, I've sacked him more than anybody who's ever played against him, but I played against him twice a year, every year. So I just knew, I just knew, all of his body language. I knew the things he would do. You know, if you got your hands on him, I just knew the little mind games he would play. I, I, I mean, I even knew, I, I even had his cadence of when his hands were going to open under the, but those were things, those are the little things that, you know, our coaches, we would work on, you know, and his patterns. And it, it, I just, I, I, I just knew him. So he was always really tough. He was tough. And uh, he, but he was one of those guys, if they're winning, then he's going to want to talk in between plays. You know, he'd be like, Rob, what's up, man? How's the family? You know, if, if they're winning. But if we're beating them, you'd be like, Brad, what's up? He just won because you're not going to talk today. <laughs> well, look, man, this has been an absolute uh, treat for me. So I certainly appreciate the time. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, man. I, I know that all the fans that are watching out there, uh, I've said certainly, you know, a lot of great stories, but a lot of great lessons too. And for oh, absolutely. Robert uh, Porsche's story, there is uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. So again, thank you so much. And thank you out there for watching uh, Robert Porsche's edition of In-Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Boy, what a treat it was. We got another great episode for you coming next week as well. Have a great one, everyone.